I V M. The Good Food Institute's website went up on February first, twenty sixteen. It was a team of five people brought together with a laser focus to accelerate the future of food and the new protein sector for the planet and for people. At the time, Impossible Foods and Beyond Meat had been creating buzz and garnering attention for some time, with their aim to make meat from plants. And Memphis Meats had just launched as the first cultivated meat company in the world, focused on making animal meat from cells instead of by raising and slaughtering livestock. Bill Gates had even written in 2013 that the Beyond Meat chicken strips he had tried were not just a clever meat substitute; they were the future of food. Fast forward to 2019. and the plant based meat sector has entered hyperdrive globally and cultivated meat is poised for commercialization the good food institute is now a global non-profit network of nearly 100 people building and accelerating the sector with eight of us in mumbai building the indian ecosystem from the ground up and nowhere is this dizzying growth of new protein more apparent than at our annual good food conference this september Nearly 900 attendees from the worlds of scientific research, business and marketing, product development and entrepreneurship, as well as policy and government, descended on San Francisco for only the second edition of the Good Food Conference. The interest and enthusiasm from even the most hardened of food industry and government veterans was palpable and staggering, and may not have been possible even a year ago. So this week. As we prepare for GFI India's own Future of Protein Summit in New Delhi on November 11th and 12th, we're taking the opportunity to bring you a dispatch from the Good Food Conference. You're going to hear a panel discussion featuring leaders from the global new protein sector. Seth Goldman is the executive chairman at Beyond Meat and David Lipman is the chief scientific officer at Impossible Foods. Of course, two absolute rocket ship companies actively changing the way the world thinks about food. Rosie Waddle is program director at Fair, a global network of investors focused on changing food supply by making corporations aware of the risks of industrial animal agriculture. Oh, and did I mention their investor networks manage about 19 trillion dollars worth of assets? That's trillion with a T. Stephanie Feldstein from the Center for Biological Diversity is an expert on climate change and environmental risks. Max Elder from the Institute for the Future Foods Lab is a razor sharp researcher and analyst on technology and its influence on the future. And it also features my co-host Varun Deshpande, managing director for India at the Good Food Institute, representing our perspective on locating the sector within the context of the developing world. The panel is expertly marshaled by Adam Rogers of Wired Magazine. I'm Ramya Ramurthy, the communications specialist at the Good Food Institute India. and you're listening to a special episode of feeding 10 billion my name is adam rogers i'm a, a science writer with wired and and what i'm hoping is that we can um really basically fight with each other for the next hour or so um i don't know does that sound right uh let me just introduce who we have up here uh with me sorry um so uh, from my left to my further left cheese if the fog came in i wouldn't be able to see this entire panel <laughs> <laughs> how are you down there max are you pretty okay varun uh so um from my left seth goldman the executive chair uh of beyond meat next to him david lipman the chief science officer from impossible foods you guys have probably heard of those companies right uh yeah <laughs> maybe i'll have you introduce yourselves just to explain kind of what you guys are doing um next to them rosie wardle uh, program director from the jeremy collar foundation um and oh fans so, all right bigger applause for each succeeding one stephanie feldstein uh population sustainability director from the center for biological diversity uh max elder the research director from the future foods lab at the institute for the future uh and then way, uh, way down at the end uh, varun deshpande the managing director of gfi india um thank you all for being up here i want to start just by having folks do kind of a quick uh tight two or three um introduction um sort of what they're working on i know some of the these organizations and people are familiar to you but just to sort of say what we're going to be talking about and kind of their work in the context specifically of what this panel is about which is the environmental and, and public health risks um what i'm hoping to talk about is both the of the existing kind of global food system and then also what happens as the that food system transitions to what we've been talking about here for the last day or so so when we do that we'll just go down real fast and then i'll start um yelling at people and having them yell at me 
Please. So I'll go first. Um, first of all, it's just wonderful to be here. This is, this is the arrival of a movement, and uh, to feel like this group of people is making such transformational things happen uh, so powerfully and in such a united way is, is just wonderful. And so congratulations to all of you and all of us for all being in the room together, making change happen. Um, <laughs> so uh, we're going to be talking here about um, the impact that, of our businesses, what we're doing. And, and um, part of the impact, uh, this is something I learned when I launched Honest Tea, is that when you believe in something, if you believe in it, and you believe that the, every time you're selling your product and making your product, you're, you're having an intrinsic positive impact relative to the alternative, then your um, duty and almost requirement is to bring it to scale. And so I'm going to just focus my immediate remarks here just a little bit on um, the IPO that Beyond Meat had earlier this year. Some of you may have heard about it. Um, and uh, I, I've already learned that when I talk about an IPO, you have to be very careful uh, because there's all the Reg FD and selective disclosure laws. So I have to speak about it in a little bit of an abstract way. But luckily, you only have about 90 seconds to do it. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. But I just wanted to share the, the, the decision making that led to that. Um, we felt that, as I said, we're, we're building a business that, that has the potential to, 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 to really make change happen. Uh, and we'd been in business for 10 years, and like a lot of people in this room, when you've been in business for 10 years, if you've been in business for 10 years, you know it's a, uh, it's, it's a, it's a grind um, to get to profitability, to get distribution, to get to sales. And so we felt a duty to start thinking about how our shareholders were going to get their money back, and a, a duty to think about making sure we had access to capital going forward. And so uh, we looked at what the options were, and you know, at Honest Tea, we had sold to Coca-Cola, that made sense for that business because we needed access to distribution. Uh, with Beyond Meat, we saw tremendous gains in, in distribution. We knew that the challenge was going to just make sure we had access to capital. And so um, there had, we learned a few things when we went to explore that. Um, first of all, there had only been five IPOs uh, in food and beverage over the past 10 years, so it's not something that happens frequently. We also learned you, know, you had to be a business of about a, a, at least $100 million in sales. You had to have some lens or, or visibility towards profitability and, and um, anticipating um, quarterly growth for the next three to five quarters. And we started at what's called test the waters, and we got positive response. We understood there was um, interest. Um, the other thing we learned, there's a whole group of investors called ESG investors, um, which we call socially responsible investors, investors think about environmental and social and governance criteria. And it was my impression that they really didn't have much to invest in. Um, they look at uh, public companies, and most of those options are basically trying to do less bad. There really wasn't just a pure uh, play investment in, in a company that, doing this, something so affirming. I'm going, be, I'm going to be brutal and ruthless. That's fine. I know we're going to talk yep. more about that, because I know yep. ESG is one of the things we're going to talk about, but I want to make sure that okay. we get down, on, get down the line, and then, we'll, and then we'll come back to talking about that in a second. Uh, so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just going to ask David to, to take that as a kind of segue from there, and then we'll come back. And I learned my lesson, actually. Uh, uh, so Impossible Foods, the mission there is to eliminate the need for animals in the food system by creating delicious plant-based meats. And deliciousness is key, and that's really been driving much of our decisions because if people don't choose uh, plant-based meats over animal meats, then we're going to be stuck with the current problem. I've only been working there for two years. I'm a physician by training. I was at the National Institutes of Health for many years. And I was the head of a group that did work um, on a lot of the other aspects of why this is important to do, which is we work with uh, CDC, uh, FDA, uh, USDA, and other international agencies on food safety, applying genomics to try to really speed our identification of the source of foodborne outbreaks. Obviously, animal, animal meats are a big problem there. We also worked uh, uh, on an international uh, initiative on antimicrobial resistance. Again, a huge public health problem which, since in this country about 70% of the antibiotics that are purchased are for animals, that's a really serious problem. Um, the other area that I actually did research myself on was in viral diseases, among them the emerging infectious diseases that are also a part of the issue when you have um, uh, animals as a, a major part of the food system. The last point I'd say that was my own personal interest that got me uh, to take this job is that Right now, technology since the 70s has not had the impact on productivity uh, that it has had in the past. Since the 70s, IT and communications has not really had the impact of things like the various public health measures, antibiotics, even air conditioning. And so this is another opportunity to make a huge jump in productivity 
by eliminating animals, making food production much more productive. And what we see with the true productivity gains is improvements in quality of life, which I think is another reason why we need to move to plant-based meats. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Rosie Wardle, and I'm the program director of the Jeremy Collar Foundation. Um, we have an initiative called FAIR, which is a network of investors focused on financial risk and opportunity in food systems and in protein production specifically. And that's what I'll focus on today. So just as quick background, our founder, Jeremy Collar, is an investor himself. He's kind of built his career in the private equity industry and one is, is one of the pioneers of the um, private equity secondaries market. So when we were thinking about, as a foundation, how we can have impact in the food sector, we felt that it made sense for us to work with investors, help them to understand those risks and opportunities um, that we'll talk about today. Um, so FAIR is a global network of investors, large publicly, public equity investors. Um, just to give one example from the state we're in, CalPERS, the US's largest pension fund with 300 billion in assets, is one of our members. Um, and together, our whole network represents over $17 trillion of um, assets, and that's kind of growing week on week. And this real um, kind of mainstreaming of the concept of ESG investment, as Seth mentioned, has been a big, big driver of that. So what we do at FAIR is essentially work to educate investors and the financial community on the risk and opportunities, and then mobilize them to engage with the large global food companies that they're invested in in their portfolios to improve practices and also see the opportunity that are coming from new companies like Beyond Meat who are entering the public market too. And it's, it's a very exciting space and we're getting a lot of traction. So we'll look forward to talking more about that. I'm Stephanie with the Center for Biological Diversity. And we were really the first national environmental organization to start addressing the role of food and animal agriculture in particular in the climate and extinction crises that we're facing today. And as part of our work to really shift diets and transform the food system, uh, a lot of what we do is working to advance the, the uh, accessibility, the availability, and the acceptance of plant-based foods. And we do that through a variety of ways, um, such as outreach, getting people to better understand the impact of food and how it relates to other issues they care about, um, through making sure that plant-based foods are available everywhere people eat, in restaurants, in schools, and even within our own movement, from local group meetings up to international climate talks. Um, and then we also work on advancing policy that can help support um, you know, getting more plant-based foods out in the market. And so it's, it's a really exciting time now. We've seen with all the new products and innovation happening in this space, um, you know, we're for the first time really seeing a disruption that makes it feel feasible that this transformation that we desperately need can happen. Hi, everyone. My name is Max Elder. I'm a research director at the Institute for the Future. And we help individuals, organizations, nonprofits, governments, big companies uh, think more systematically about long-term futures. And I wanted to share a, a former president of the Institute named Roy Amara came up with something that's now been coined Amara's Law, which is that uh, we tend to overestimate the impact of a new technology in the short run, but underestimate the impact in the long run. And what I'm here to talk about today is what those underestimated potential long-term impacts of some of these new technologies could be, and to try to push everyone to think a bit more strategically, systematically, provocatively, creatively about what those could be if we designed for them intentionally today. And um, I, last year, worked with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Actually, I think a colleague here, Ashley Wu, brilliant. Hey, Ashley. Ashley's brilliant. Ashley worked on this with me at the foundation. Um, to really step back and think one of these big problems that hasn't been solved globally is uh, nutrition. And uh, I don't need to convince anyone here, I think, that the food system doesn't work for everyone. And that, quite frankly, most affordable foods are not very nutritious and most nutritious foods aren't very affordable. And so we worked with the Gates Foundation's nutrition team to step back and think what might be some big opportunity spaces for the private sector to see good food as being good business and to really develop in a radically new way really affordable, accessible, appealing, nutritious foods for lower income communities around the world. And part of that report involves cellular agriculture and involves some uh, creative ways of imagining how this type of system scaled into the future could actually provide really nutritious foods to those people who really need it, not high income folks in Silicon Valley, um, but perhaps people who really are facing serious nutrition deficits. And so I'm hoping that we can talk a little bit more. I know this is brief, 
um, about that work, that report, and just about long-term thinking to ensure that we're designing plant-based and cellular agriculture um, in ways that has intention and that is anticipatory of new possibilities and opportunities as opposed to being kind of reactionary once we get into the scaled futures. Max, is it easy enough to say that there's a URL that folks can tinker on their phone yeah. while you have it? Yeah, the report is at iftf.org forward slash good food is good business. I think if you just Google good food is good business and the Institute for the no. Future, you'll find it. It's a big report um, that talks about a lot of things, including cellular agriculture. I'm just trying to get people to, off Twitter. Yeah. Go look at that. Thanks for that so, plug. I love that. Yeah. Sure. All right. So everyone's energy level is okay after all of that. <laughs> um, yeah. So my name is Varun Deshpande. I'm the managing director for India at the Good Food Institute. And if you're here, you know a little bit about what we do, right? So one of the questions that underpins our work, in fact, probably the fundamental question that underpins our work is, how are we going to feed 10 billion people by 2050 through systems which don't negatively impact sustainability, scarce natural resources, climate change, antimicrobial resistance, uh, and of course, other public health risks. And this is especially crucial in markets like India, in Asia, in Africa over time taking a little bit of that forward-thinking lens to it, that 2050 lens to it, uh, because India is going to have a sixth of the world's population by that time. India, Africa, Asia, Asia and Africa together are going to have over 60% of the world's population at that time. And if you look at consumption of animal-sourced foods or demand for protein in general, much of the growth in it is going to come in these geographies over time. And if you set that against the backdrop of the malnutrition, uh, and the issues of land use and sustainability that are already taking root in these countries, uh, we simply cannot afford less bad thinking, right? We have to think uh, in terms of paradigm shifts. We have to think in terms of Amara's law. We have to think, how can we get to where we're going in 2050 and install that capacity now, the talent pool now, the investment now? We have to be really visionary about it. Uh, and I'm, I'm looking forward to talking about a little bit of that. Right, that's great. Now I can, I'll bring out the rest of the panel. Um, the next, we've just got about 10 more folks. Let's do a little um, stage setting first. Varun started us down this path, but I, I think maybe just starting with Stephanie and Rosie, outline the shape of the apocalypse here. What problems are we hoping to deal with, especially as, as uh, they relate to a, the food system that we currently eat out of? Well, to start outlining the apocalypse, we have 11 years to avoid catastrophic climate change. That doesn't mean we get to start 10 years from now. That means we need to start drastically reducing emissions now. We're also in the middle of a wildlife extinction crisis. It's estimated that in the next few decades, a million more species will go extinct. And we're already seeing these things unfold in things like hurricanes that are more destructive and unpredictable in the, the irreplaceable ecosystems that are being lost in the Amazon right now. I mean, we... You can go on and on. The stakes could not be higher when we're talking about the environment right now. And part of that is recognizing where a lot of this environmental damage comes from. And food production, but particularly meat and dairy production, is one of the most destructive industries on Earth. No matter what metric you're looking at, they're the top, if not one of, they're one of the top, if not the top, you know, offender in that, whether you're talking about contributions to climate change, habitat loss, water use, pesticide use. We could spend the whole hour talking just about that. So it's not all doom and gloom, though, because that also means that the opportunity is huge and that the difference between the harms caused by animal agriculture and the benefits and potential that we see in plant-based foods is, is massive and that we see in report after report that that has to be that shifting towards those plant-based foods has to be a key component in avoiding the apocalypse that, I, that we talked about earlier. Can, can I ask just to, for yes. a little specificity there, though? It, uh, all of those um, problems, are they because of the, of the material that's being produced, or are they because of how much we produce it, how much we produce and how much we charge for it? Right? Like, is it because it is cutting pieces off of dead animals to feed them to people, or is it because there's just so much of it and it would be true of, of anything that was that big? It's both. Um, because comparatively, you know, like, like pound for pound, producing meat from animals has a much higher environmental cost than producing protein from plants. But I think it is an important point to talk about the scale of it as well, because a lot of times we're looking for these mitigation solutions in agriculture or shifting toward, you know, re regenerative grazing or things like that, and it simply won't work. There are too many people eating too much meat for any form of meat production to be sustainable right now. 
And so, Rosie, because obviously the most important thing about that is how it affects investors. Um, <laughs> I like seeing how, how that washed out over the crowd and then came back. It's like a tide that comes out. Hi, everyone. Um, but in slightly more seriousness, is it possible to build that into fiduciary responsibility? Is it possible to build those problems into, into ESG investing? Can you go to just to like institutional investors and say, oh, but also could you stop burning down the planet? Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. And we're starting to see that happen with the work that we're doing with FAIR. So we essentially take the risk that Stephanie outlined there to the planet and human health and translate that into what that means to the bottom line. And it, it, I mean, you don't have to um, kind of, it's a very compelling case, even on an individual risk level. So take something like antibiotic resistance, which we already mentioned. Um, it's an estimated 700,000 people dying every year from this already. That's probably a very low estimate. A recent UK government report predicted that um, by 2050 that could rise to 10 million people a year so that's more than cancer and diabetes combined and it seems rather heartless to translate that into what does that mean for investment risk but you can I mean right now I think in the US it's something like two billion dollars cost to healthcare from antibiotic resistance um, that same UK government report predicted but again by 2050 if we don't address this now the impact of the global economy could be a hundred trillion dollars by 2050 so these are serious numbers, and investors are really starting to understand that uh, both in the long term and in the shorter term, that's having an impact on the bottom line for companies. And again, with antibiotic resistance, we're seeing a trend from you know, the retailers and restaurants to think about antibiotic, well, responsible policies for antibiotic use, antibiotic-free. And the companies that aren't doing that and aren't implementing responsible policies are then being left behind when and consumers are starting to think more about these issues. Again, we're having um, regulatory risk, for instance. So the EU has recently passed new legislation to ban completely routine use of antibiotics in livestock production. So we're seeing this both in the short term and in the longer term. There's real investment risk here, which means we can then mobilize investors to engage with companies to improve practices. Okay. So Seth and David, solve all those problems. What's the response then to say, all right, well, now there's a, there's a product, there's, yep. a, there's a, a system that you can bring to bear, both sure. two different directions that then address what they just described? So, you know, we, we ran a life cycle analysis um, by the uh, University of Michigan, which found that a, the, a Beyond Burger reuses 99% less land, 93% less water than the Beef Burger. And so when you talk about the fires in the Amazon, those are directly correlated with, in fact, they have to clear, clear land to grow crops to feed animals. Um, so there's no question that this approach is, is a more sustainable one uh, from an environmental perspective. Well, I have, a, I have some question that there is, because that's, that's as, it, as, as production and quantities exist now. Does that remain true if, the, you know, if you start to replace vast fields of soy designed to feed to cows and pigs with vast fields of pea to isolate the protein out of? Does, this, does, the, does the marginal benefit oh, yeah, go no, away? No, without question, because our crops go directly to the, the finished product. Um, the yield on a, you know, I, I think the best case scenario I've heard is a chicken use basically nine calories of food produced uh, in grains to get one calorie of chicken. So you're, and, and I think cows more like 40x. So it's just, there's no question. Yeah, less, yeah. less land. I mean, it comes down to an efficiency point here, which is why it also is compelling from an investment perspective. I mean, we need to feed more people with less. And so feeding plants to humans directly makes much more sense than cycling it through an animal. E even though there, there's still a, I mean, the, the work that a, the work that a cow used to do to convert those plants into itself now happens in a reactor, right? Like there's still, that's still an energy intensive process. That's still, that's a process that's now controlled by IP versus by genes. Like it, it, but, but all we have to do is make delicious food from it. What does a cow have to do? The cow has to grow. Mm -hmm. The cow has to poop. Mm -hmm. The cow has to procreate. The cow is doing tons of things that we don't need to do. And so that's why you have this, it's usually thought of as like as about a 90% opportunity cost mm -hmm. to take crops and feed them to, to animals as opposed to, to cows especially, as opposed to feeding them to humans. So I think the huge drop of getting out that middleman, that middle animal, is the biggest win. And there's no other area 
in terms of using technology, innovation technology, to make an impact on productivity than that. We, we don't have those kinds of gains open to us. Yeah. And that's, I think, why people are investing in Beyond Meat, and that's why there's a lot of excitement about what we're doing at Impossible as well. What um, potential risks or obstacles do you see as you grow that, as more and more transnational fast food restaurants start serving the products, more and more supermarkets start carrying it as the, as the, the land that you need to grow the feedstock has to increase. What do you, like, do you worry about anything? What do you, what do you see coming? I worry about lots of things. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but, I, of it, but no, I want to point out something that people don't talk about enough, and I think it's, you know, we understand that subsidies, crop subsidies, have had a lot of bad effects, okay? But if you look out right now at what are the options for really good quality, dense sources of protein in the plant world, the number of options we have that are cheap enough to be able to feed places like India and China, or even make them so that people would buy in America, uh, they're not that many, right? right? And it's very difficult. If you're trying to make delicious plant-based foods and have them really be nutritious enough but still affordable, the number of options we have is not many. And, And I think ultimately another kind of competition I'd like to see is among countries who are starting to develop other kinds of crops that are really targeted towards humans, but that can be used as dense sources of high-quality protein because we just don't have the number of options we want. Max, you told me a number yesterday, the number, the number of staple crops and what percentage of people they all fed. It's like some, uh, like half a dozen plants that are, are some ridiculous percentage of the food that everybody eats. Yeah, I mean, so I think stepping back, part of the problem and maybe a potential design solution is that our food system just relies way too heavily on a very small number of plants and animals to feed all of the mouths on, on Earth. And I think that has a host of long-term unintended consequences. And so one hopeful opportunity space is to not just shift between a small number of plants and a small number of animals back and forth, but instead to actually use these new platforms of food production to go after new types of inputs that promote much more biodiversity across our food system and do that contextual to different geographies and to the nutrition profiles of specific eaters. So one of the things, I mean, the last time I checked, the World Health Organization recommends that every child has a minimum of four different food groups every day to reach their minimum dietary diversity to ensure that they have adequate nutrition. And in India, one in five children meet that minimum dietary diversity. It's 19%, same in Nigeria. And so if we're really trying to think through how these types of production processes can solve new types of problems in the long term, we might want to look towards target eaters, focus just as much on the food as who's eating it, and then redesign the food production process to ensure that we solve some of these problems at a much more systematic level. But but do those, maybe Varun, this is something you you can address, does diversification of the the root stock, the, 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 the feed stock, the plants that that we use, potentially the animals too, though I know that's not for this room necessarily, does that fit into something that, in, that, that companies can make into a product, that investors can wrap their heads around? Does that, how do you connect um, small farmers with a diversity of crops to, um, to a, a company like Beyond or Impossible that's try, that has an IPO and wants to be international? Yeah, I mean, I want to stress that this is a hard problem to solve, but the good thing is that it's I think we can do it up here. I think we got it. Uh, yeah, we have 33 minutes, so yeah. we can do it. Um, this is a hard problem to solve, but the great thing is there are movements towards this already all over the world, and you've already hinted at it, and you mentioned it as well. So in countries like India, in regions like Sub-Saharan Africa, thanks to the work of governments, foundations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, a lot of work is going on in working with smallholder farmers, getting them to move away from monocropping, getting them to look at indigenous crops, which are inherently more sustainable. So in India, we have, at the Good Food Institute India, we have a sort of indigenous crops initiative where we're working with research institutes to look at how we can optimize millets for use in plant-based foods, plant-based meat specifically. So are there millet protein blends that make sense, that are micronutrient complete in a much better way than than regular uh, inputs into this sector? And I think diversification has to come along with uh, being allied with these movements. But the great thing is it's happening. 
We just have to leverage it and, and make sure that it is optimized for an end use, as we say. Well, that's what I'm trying to figure out, it, it, because it does seem like, just from me 10 miles away from you right now, that diversification is almost in opposition to the industrialization that, that you both are talking about, that you both need to have a successful company. We're, we're trying to build a platform that is plant agnostic. So absolutely, plants go in, but we should be able to do the same thing with uh, buckwheat as we do with peas, as we do with lupins. Wow. That's that's fa- uh, can I I want to nerd out on that yeah. a little bit because yeah. the like one of the things that happens if you try to change a grain in a distillery is that one grain glops up more than another one when you try yeah. to move through the same pipes. Yeah. Can you actually do that with No, that's the goal though is to, to go to each continent, find a local biome crop. Every crop, every continent has a has a crop that has, you know, protein rich and so the, which are the ones that we can extract and and use our science for. Wow. Okay. Once you do that, then am I not trusting my food to a new tech company instead of the old tech company? Well, now we, you've, turned, you've, yeah. you've gone from being a cow to being IP, have you not? Yeah, oh, absolutely. This is IP for sure. But no, I mean, the nutritional panel should still be the same, and we, we, we'll have to stand by it. We'll have to you know, deliver on the same promise. Oh, for sure. I, yeah. I, was actually, I wasn't thinking so much of the, of, of the nutritional aspect of yeah. the public health as, as maybe more of kind of what David worked on in his previous life at NIH. Like, do we now think that any tech company yours are perfect, but that any tech company, future tech companies out there, can handle that level of responsibility of my own, like, not just my nutrition, but my health, my ability to not consume the wrong virus in the eventual GM version of this that we do. Like, how do we know you guys can do that? Well, we're non-GMO certified, so we're not going to use any. I, it's not, not you guys specifically. The, your ilk, I guess, is what I yeah. mean. The, well, I, I do think that's important, though. Transparency to the consumer is going to only continue to be important. They all have to understand what they're consuming, um, you know, obviously we'll have to be truthful in the ingredient panel, but we need to be versatile um, as we go to, eat, to expand globally. David, I want, you, I want you to address that too. How do you, how do you um, thinking in terms of the kind of health stuff that you studied, that you've already done research in, how do you build that into the process that the company uses I mean, to make I the food? I think that you're talking about what is the accountability? What is the accountability in terms of how we use uh, herbicides or what is the accountability in terms of how we build our plants or whatever else and I think uh, uh, just as Seth said we have to be transparent okay there are small companies that are doing things that we they shouldn't be doing and there's large companies that I think are uh, charting a very responsible course and I think that uh, the key is to have transparency with the public and to be clear about what your mission is all right Um, but uh, you know we're not going to solve all of our problems at once, okay? There's going to be parts of this process that, that we may disagree with, but I think we have to keep very clear what the goal is. This is both a huge challenge and a huge risk. Animals in the food system, you look at India, 70% or 75% had been vegetarians, and now what is it, 50%? 71% are non-vegetarian, hmm. uh, as polled recently, but if we count eggs as non-vegetarian. The point is that, I mean, religion is not as big a stricture to non-vegetarian eating as we thought it was. Yeah. The thing is, there's a dramatic increase just at the wrong time. There's an increase in meat consumption in the growing parts of the, of the world, and we have to deal, we have to create affordable, delicious, healthy, plant-based meats that people choose to eat. We're not going to be able to force them to eat because, in fact, what's happened in China and India is that as they had more income, they've been eating more meat. And so let's be very clear about what our target and our goal is. And, yes, we need to be accountable and we need to be transparent. But, I mean, if we try to fight every possible battle at once and if we try, if we're asking for some kind of perfection in every approach, we're not going to actually achieve the goal. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, we need to feed 10 billion people and all production systems have impact. It's about finding the most efficient way to feed those people with the, the least impact possible. But feeding 10 billion people in, kind of, in a just way as well as an accessible way, right? Like if, you're, if all you're doing is producing cheap calories with a nutritional panel that a CDC or a WHO or a FDA approves for, the, for 99.9% and then a Point one percent has enough money to actually afford the dead animals. Like that's not a rebuilt system. That's the same system with different companies in charge, right? I think it's important to note that it's no longer good enough to just be better than beef. That you know, to go back to kind of the apocalyptic situation that we're in, there's no single product that can solve it all. There's also no single industry that can solve it all. 
And we need to acknowledge it. That's what all the leading scientists on the planet are telling us. Mm -hmm. We need to acknowledge how cross-sector this problem is, which means that, yes, to get it out the door, in order to get people to eat it and accept it, it needs to taste good. And that, you kind of need to do what you need to do to get there. But I think there also needs to be a plan in place and a commitment to how do we continue to make these products better? That how do we admit that? How do, we, how do we acknowledge that, you know, there are a limited number of ingredients available because our subsidy system is broken? And how do we all start working towards changing that? How do we make sure that operations are not just, you know, causing fewer emissions than cattle, but that are actually energy efficient, that are investing in solar energy and those sorts of things to make sure that really across the board that we're doing the best that we can. And it's not just on the plant-based meat companies now, like it's not all your problem. But we need to leapfrog. We have an opportunity here to leapfrog the mistakes of the yeah. past. But Max, I know you. I know you have a thing, but Varun did too. Let me let me bounce between yeah. you two. Well, firstly, we have a leapfrog jar in our office in India, where every time I say the word leapfrog, I have to put in a rupee. And uh, <laughs> I no, but but also I want to say a little bit more about that, right? Like, in order to make sure that good business is aligned with good food from a nutrition standpoint. There's a lot of work that's underway that, that the government is responsible for. And if you go into, let's say, the premier government policy think tank in India, if you go into their offices, you will see plastered all over the walls the sustainable development goals printed out. You will see people imbued with a sense of aligning with the nutrition security of the country. There's a real sense of purpose in these countries, low and middle income countries around the world, regions like Southeast Asia, that the principal task is to transform themselves internally over the next decades. Right? The interplay between that and business is what we need to align. And I'm, I'm really glad that FAIR exists. I'm really glad that companies like Impossible and Beyond exist to demonstrate the market pull of good food because we need that. Right? That's how you get companies that are the biggest in the world also aligned with our sector and moving in the right direction. I totally agree that there, right, there's no such thing as a free lunch and we should be very skeptical of silver bullets. So there's no one industry and everything has an impact. But I think the really critical thing that we all need to do today, yesterday, is to really clearly articulate the value proposition of creating good food to the private sector. Because right now, when you look, especially at vulnerable populations, the percentage of their food basket that's purchased is pretty high, and the percentage of purchased food is, that's processed is also increasing. And so we are succeeding at scaling food systems. They're just not scaling in the way that they need to be. And so how do we clearly articulate that the social license for any of these companies to operate is shifting underneath their feet, and that shared value concepts are really huge opportunities, and that we can create more affordable, accessible, appealing, nutritious foods, and it can be good business to do so. And so how can we help really clearly articulate that value proposition so that the private sector seems like this space is de-risked a bit and can really enter so that we create this type of food system that we all are trying to talk about and do? And it needs to involve the private sector. I mean, it, it absolutely needs to. And I, I, I turn this into a policy wonk fest for a second, and that's my fault. But I, so I want to geek out back in the science direction for a second. If, the, if that's all right. And Rosie, I'm sorry, you, you had a thing you wanted to come in first. Today. This conference is super hopeful. And all the conversations, especially from the large meat players, for instance, who have been here, is very encouraging. I think we've seen that shift very quickly in the space of like three, four years. That's changing. And there's excitement around the opportunities in the space. But there's a huge way to go. And Matt's got to plug his report. So I'm also going to plug ours, which is just released this week and an assessment of the 60 largest animal protein producers globally. And three quarters of those companies were assessing as high risk because they're just not managing these risks. So we need a more strategic, integrated approach from these companies. Good. I want to jump off of that. Um, Seth, you mentioned uh, figuring out ways to use different feedstocks. What are some of the other scientific challenges to making sure that as you expand and grow, both of you, that your environmental and public health responsibilities stay fulfilled. What else, what other science do you need to get done going forward? Well, we're certainly looking at the health profile of what we're doing. So, you know, uh, and this is a neat thing about both of our technologies is we continue to iterate, you know, really on a yearly basis. So we've already made progress around saturated fat. Can we reduce that? Uh, that's something we've, we've done. Uh, sodium levels are relatively high, not because we're adding salt, but just because of some of the process of the ingredients we receive. And so uh, continuing to do that. What's nice about it is our competition, which in this case is the cow, is static. You know, the cow's not evolving. And so we can keep improving against that, and, and, and yet we know what the target is. I mean, you know, a challenge accepted for somebody who's working on cow genetics, I suppose. But okay, <laughs> what, what about you, David? What are, what are the science questions you want to answer going forward? Well, I think, I think uh, 
as I see it, you know, we have to create the variety. We have to create the healthiest possible product. And as Seth said, you know, we have the ability to do that. Unfortunately, I would just reiterate my point from before. For the main proteins that we use, the affordable, high-quality choices that we have anywhere in the world, really, are not big enough. And so whatever we can do to be opportunistic, as Seth says, so that we can use what's in certain countries, but also we have to figure out what it takes to try and create the incentives so that, you know, even looking at something like rapeseed, where now where there's going to be some, I think, some pretty good quality protein for humans from, from rapeseed, but the cost of that is going to be high enough compared to a number of the options that it's, going to, its use is going to be limited. So it's sort of like, you know, 10 years from now, five years from now, everybody's going to see the opportunity in that, and they're going to start investing. But we really need them to start investing right now. I think a really important point in that that often is overlooked, which is that we can't just focus on the supply. So if you look at the United States, for example, the last USDA report that I read said that while there are specific populations with deficiencies across both sexes and every age group, Americans consume twice as much protein as they need to. And so, yes, we don't have the right scale yet, um, but we also overconsume in massive ways. And if we're really trying to create a healthy and humane and sustainable food system, we need to rethink not only supply but also demand and the context in which those meet to create the conditions that engender healthier consumption. And some of that might mean we need to stop consuming so much, and we need to think about strategies that can enable that transition. So it's both, yes, we want these big companies to succeed and scale, and we want to deliver healthy, sustainable protein, but we also need to step back and really look at what we're eating. Yeah, I mean, I think you're exactly right in what you're saying, and it's set against this backdrop of, I would argue at this point, that sustainability and healthfulness are as much of a halo effect on business now as innovation has been traditionally. So if you're not seen as innovative, you're dead in the water, right? Because everything you've done is a lagging rather than a leading indicator of your success. But now we have movements in countries and in business that are aligning big business with sustainability, that are aligning big business with healthfulness. And of course, it's going to take some time to get there. There was just a report that snack foods in India are the the lowest on the health index anywhere in the world. We have a very young regulator. Right? We have a very young country in terms of our state capacity, in terms of our institutions. And so to align good food with good business, we have to really do the work. But I think that it's happening as we speak, which is great. So since our sector is growing against this backdrop, we're going to have to meet those standards, exceed them, but also show to the big companies of the world what innovation looks like, what sustainability looks like. And I mean, I would trust a tech company like Impossible or Beyond to do that a little bit better than a really large behemoth, right? Is that true even as, as the large transnational food companies start to buy smaller companies in the alternative protein space or as they start to make their own? Does that trust extend to companies who shall not be named? Because I don't want to alienate any of them sitting out in the audience. I mean, I kind of do want to alienate them a little bit, but I, maybe I won't. <laughs> you know, they'll listen to what you're saying. Look, the thing is that... Uh, you know, the large transnational companies in energy in all of these areas, you know, we have to, or, or, or the uh, IT companies in Silicon Valley or whatever, we have to hold everyone's feet to the fire, ours as well. And, you know, sometimes in certain countries on certain issues, people do change pretty fast. And we do see, you know, uh, trans fats that that's out largely in, in our diet. So we can make change, and it'll be really interesting to see what happens, for example, with the Facebooks and, and Googles and all of the stuff where, where we're seeing the sort of negative side of technological innovation. But I also think that we can't get paralyzed by the fact that, well, I see a, something I don't like in one approach. I mean, the, the, the opportunity and the risk, if we don't, we don't take the, this problem on of, of animals in the food system, you know, Stephanie, when you said like 11 years, you know, you're, you're talking about that, you know, but that's like, that's only looking at the environmental impact. That's not the emerging infectious disease. That's not the AMR, the antimicrobial resistance problem. I mean, there's so much risk in front of us right now. 
and we have, we're starting to see some momentum to change that. So, um, yeah, and I think it's encouraging that the big multinationals are seeing the opportunity here and they're starting to, whether it's invest or do their own internal R&D and bring out these product lines that are, you know, plant-based and address some of these issues. But yeah, because they, because they see what Varun was talking about with a hockey stick of demand going up in places like India yeah. and China. The, the, so the, the that opportunity good? is there. Wait, isn't that good? I, I, you, you've had a certain tack through this which it's, you know, capitalism and economic system, there's good and bad with it, but one of the good things is that when there's the opportunity for a big productivity gain and people see there's potential to make money, we can make change. Some of that change led to antibiotics. Some of that change led to air conditioning. Some of that change came to much safer cars. There's a lot of things that are good that have come out of a profit motive, yep. right? And I got to say, you know, Pat Brown, who's the founder of, of Impossible Foods, he was an academic at Stanford. He was a cancer researcher. And when he realized this is the most important problem, far more important than curing cancer, he went to the government. He wanted to raise, get money to do research on how to make delicious plant-based meats. And guess where he got? Nowhere. Mm -hmm. Who was willing to invest? The folks in Silicon Valley. So yeah, there's the good and bad on both that. This is too dangerous just to sort of get paralyzed by some of the things that you're, you're berating, yeah. raising, frankly. And, for, for sure. I, I, I mean, and I hope, I hope that my, my berating doesn't lead to paralysis. I mean, yeah, I hope that it doesn't lead to paralysis. It leads Fortunately, to shame, they're going to invest anyways, whatever right. you say. But I guess what, right, exactly, yeah, they're not listening to me. I, no, I recognize that I'm a journalist. Um, but, I, I, uh, but, but, I, but I do wonder, for, like, Varun, do those opportunities exist for, uh, for small farmers or small companies in India to also contribute and get get a piece of this sweet ESG investment uh, dollar pool? Yeah. So, Adam, I'm going to tell you a secret. All right? There's no such thing as cartoon villains. They don't exist. Right? There's, only, there's, no, there's only economic imperatives. So people within large corporations, when we talk to them, and I'm sure when FAIR talk to, talks to them and all of us up here talk to them, uh, they ask us questions like, have you found partners who can help us with the agricultural transformation piece of millets? Because we want to use millets in our food products, but right now, the supply isn't there. It's, you know, 30% more expensive, et cetera, et cetera. So the economic imperative is what matters in terms of uh, getting to a tipping point where they can make a, a wholesale change. But they, they do care about regenerative agriculture. They do care about plant-based. They do care about, I mean, people just want to provide protein to people, right? So I think that there are opportunities to access smallholder farmers in places like India, in places like sub-Saharan Africa. And, um, yeah, it, it, India is open for business. If, if, uh, if you'd like to talk to me about that, I'd be glad to talk to you about it. I mean, I agree that the urgency cannot be overstated of where we are and that we definitely don't want paralysis. But I think at the same time, we need to be careful not to excuse practices that are heading us down in down the wrong road with this. You know, when you talk about some of the other advances in technology, you talk about things like air conditioning. Well, what if getting chemicals out of that had been prioritized earlier? What if efficiency had been prioritized earlier? Maybe we wouldn't, wouldn't have the heat islands that we see in cities in the summer caused by air conditioning. I mean, all of these technologies, there are opportunities that perhaps could have been embraced earlier. And I think we're in a position now where we know what a lot of those opportunities are, and we should be striving to embrace them as early on in this process and in this movement as we can. It is really, 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 though, important to note that food is not, can't be thought of as a technology. It's very, very different. And I love the analogies to the innovation ecosystem in Silicon Valley and hearing about Facebook and innovation and profit motives. Those are great, and they can create change. But, when, I mean, when you look at Facebook's old motto is move fast and break things. And they broke our democracy. They broke trust. They broke truth. Um, they broke a lot of things, right? And so, yes, profit motives are great, and we can transition food systems based on profit, and we can show that good food can be good business. But we need to be very intentional, just even linguistically about the analogies we use, but also what they mean and how they enable us to think about this system. And maybe we should be more thoughtful about our food that we're feeding our kids than the software but that Max, we're developing. Max, for. I think I'm glad you brought this up. Here's the important distinction. Since the 70s, we've seen that the IT and communications revolution has not really led to the kind of improvements in quality of life that innovations before the 70s had. All right? This is a kind of productivity gain that actually will be measurable economically and will be measurable in terms of the impact on health, in terms of all of these other things, there's a difference. Some technological innovations 
really have been problems and have not really, you know, uh, I totally agree with you about Facebook or t Twitter or all of that stuff, that there were positives and obvious terrible negatives. But this is something where the gains are, are very different. And it's the only, actually, it's the only area I see since the 70s where the productivity gain can be coupled to quality of life so strongly. But, but nobody's arguing. Just to, to chime in here, I mean, I th we would not, I don't even know if this conference would have half the attendees it had if we were still dealing with the veggie burgers of 20 years ago. You just wouldn't see the conversion. So technology has absolutely made the difference between this staying in the small niche of the you know, 2 to 5% of the population versus the, what we see 93% of the people buying this product also buying meat. But, no, but nobody's... The, is one, I, I'm sorry to dive no, One <laughs> last thing, because I want to say is... Yeah, go. The difference, because I'm glad you brought that up. You know, what changed with Beyond and Impossible, I think, was that the founders of those companies and the companies, the people who work there, believe that making delicious plant-based meat is an important problem. It's not just a big economic opportunity. It's an important problem. It's actually the most important problem. And I think that, yes, you hold our feet to the fire because maybe we'll get immoral in the near future, but the initial motivations Same. were the right thing. And, and, and I think it's, it is leading to revolution. And why some of these bigger companies are investing is that they realize that this is going to be where the future goes. Yeah. I mean, I, look, I, I'll rage against the machine all day long and, and pretend that there are cartoon villains when, in fact, there are only profit motives. But, but nobody's arguing that the stakes aren't high. Stakes. Eh, I made a food pun. Um, right? Every, everyone, is, everyone on this panel is saying that this is, a, this is existential. Um, right? But, but then, like, when, when companies that are in this space use the same language that those social media companies, that the tech companies used, but then say, only this time trust us, it is a, uh, a hard pill to swallow. I made another food <laughs> Well, it is important to think about third-party verification on all these claims. You know, we learned it at Honest Tea around organic fair trade and, and you know, uh, with non-GMO certification. It, I agree, you can't take a company's word for it. So the extent you can have third-party verification around any claim, I, I, I think that's just part of how you do good business. Yeah, and I think the, the proof will be, or it will be interesting to see how it plays out over the next couple of years, how these big established players actually start really transitioning their protein portfolios, if you will, away from the, the meat that they're reliant on right now, or animal proteins, because right now it's great that they're seeing the opportunity, they're making these investments, they're you know, doing their own R&D, but now it is an add-on to what's already there, and actually to shift this in any meaningful way, we actually do need a protein transition away from the animal proteins, and that's the only way we're going to have a real impact. Let me, with the time we have remaining, I want to go out with both of you look, in a forward-looking way. If, uh, if the R&D dollars were not an object, what's the one research question that you think is the most critical that you'd want to answer, either for your businesses or for the, or for the space as a whole? What do you, what do you want to know? Um, well, I, I, think, I think we know it's just how we get there. What we know is we can underprice uh, animal-based meat. And so um, being able to do that will, um, with the same, you know, either be same or better nutritional properties and obviously much lighter environmental footprint, it's, it's, it feels like that's a very powerful um, transformation to make happen. Well, I'm a broken record, but I'll say it again. I, we want a broad, diverse palette of crops uh, because that's healthier for the planet, it's better for food security, and it's also better in terms of us being able to make interesting and, and, and delicious and nutritious products. And I think that we've, we've got to figure out a way to make it happen because right now we're, we're far from there. Thank you all very much. Join me in thanking the panel, please. It's Obviously, as that very wide-ranging discussion shows, there's a great deal of work still to be done to transform the food industry from the inside out. We're glad that partners and commentators are thinking through these questions very deeply and making sure to call out the risks and incentives associated with this kind of transformation. If you'd like to learn more about what's happening in our sector internationally and hear from other visionaries from the frontiers of food, you can watch the rest of the Good Food Conference videos at www.goodfoodconference.com. At the Good Food Institute India, we think that the most promising pockets of growth for the sector will be in the developing world, where we have the added pressures of malnutrition, farmers' incomes, and economic growth to balance with sustainability. If you'd like an inside view on how the sector can grow and evolve in regions like India, you should join us at the Future of Protein Summit in New Delhi on November 11th and 12th. 
Tickets are free but running out fast. So go register online right now at www.futureofprotein.in. We look forward to seeing you there. If you like this podcast, don't forget to check out other interesting shows on the IVM network. You can listen to us on the IVM podcast app or ivmpodcasts.com. You can also follow us on our social media. We are at IVM Podcasts on Twitter and Instagram. And if you want to reach out to me, I am at Varun D7 on Twitter and at Varun5 on Instagram. Come ask me why. And you can find me on Instagram as a Dithering Phenambulist and on Twitter as Cryptic Caprice. Please don't ask me why. Join us next week for another episode of Feeding 10 Billion. How many times have you caught yourself googling stuff on health and wondering if it's the right information? How many times have you heard different health experts give opposing views, which has only left you confused? There are rising cases of cancer, heart, diabetes, stress, and autoimmune diseases. Meet the patients and the experts who paved the path of true healing. Join me, Rachna Chachi, cancer nutrition coach and nutritional therapist on Heal and Hearty. I take you through my own journey of recovery from an incurable disease and the journey of so many others who healed only via nutrition and holistic healing. Find the answers you seek for what's good for your health and what's good for your soul. You can listen to us on the IVM podcast app or ivmpodcast.com. Don't forget your date with good health. How many times have you motivated yourself to improve your sleep? or lose weight or be more productive how many times have you failed hi my name is ashtin doctor tune into my show the habit coach podcast where we focus on creating small tiny habits to improve your life instead of those big impossible tasks so make listening to me a habit every monday wednesday and friday on the ivm podcast app or ivmpodcast.com or on your favorite podcasting app